Hello everyone and welcome to today's Kerbal Space Program video in which we're going to be sending the Mun Machine. Uh, the flag there is seen there. <laughs> Some of you may have seen that on Reddit. I posted it uh, last week when there was a bit of a trend for sharing custom flags. I thought, I'll show off this one. And a lot of people were asking me to show them the Mun Machine itself. Well, here you go. This is the video where you get to see the Mun Machine. Well, I mean, technically we've already sort of seen it in the thumbnail, but this is the first time you see it, um, you know, on the big screen, the small screen. We're not in a cinema. Maybe you are in a cinema. Let me know if you're watching this in a cinema. But I can already hear some of you saying, Matt, you stalling self-sycophant, what exactly even is the Mun Machine? Well, I'm glad you asked that random viewer. Um, the Mun Machine is a machine that's going to go into the Mun. But to be more specific than that, um, it's a roving base. I really enjoyed making the roving base video. Uh, well, I really enjoyed making the craft and sending the craft to Juna in my roving base on Juna video. And I kind of wanted to do the same thing again, but expand on some of the different elements of the, of the base. In particular, the size. This one is a little bit bigger than before. And it just packs a few more sort of features. It's got more science bays. Uh, just, I, think, I think personally the aesthetics have been improved. And just generally, you know, I hope... I hope that this base is a worthy successor to the roving base on Juno. And that was one of my more popular videos, so I'm assuming it's something that people enjoyed. Hopefully, maybe. So uh, I'm hoping that you'll like this video as well. Uh, the, assault, the ascent profile, or I guess the launch vehicle, um, just talking about that real quick. Obviously, the payload bay is very, very big and long, and so I kind of went for this sort of trimaran setup where I didn't want to just have a sort of conventional rocket where the... There's a massive, really long, tall stack because then it would have been very, very tall. I thought this was, this was a much more stable solution is to have the two primary boosters strapped to the side that extend all the way. In fact, they extend slightly beyond the main payload fairing. So, you know, whilst it's not the best in terms of drag, it's a lot more stable and easy to fly. And with Kerbal Space Program, especially in sandbox mode, there's no real need to try and emphasize too much on costliness or realism when you could just strap on more boosters. So this thing probably wouldn't work in real life. Well, it definitely wouldn't work in real life because of those horizontal fuel tanks that feed the side boosters. But we're in a game, so it doesn't matter. And yeah, so we have the central mammoth engine just kind of providing a little bit of thrust. But the main thrust and the control is those uh, side vectors. They're, that's a stock engine solution, just in case some of you think that's a, a modded engine cluster. It's just five vectors uh, on one of the uh, larger fuel tanks. Uh, they're great for controlling the uh, rocket because they have a huge amount of gimbal. They're designed for space shuttles, which are you know, notoriously unstable on flight. And the Mammoth engine is just there as well to provide that little bit of additional thrust. It doesn't really have that much fuel reserve itself, though. As you can see, it's only got the smallest of the large fuel tanks feeding into it. So once the vectors have run out, that engine will only have a very minimal amount of delta V before we'll have to switch to the orbital engine stage. Uh, and again, because we're going to the MUN, which is, you know, relatively close to Kerbin. We don't actually need that much fuel. Although, in my, in its defense, uh, going, you could probably take this into Juna as well. Uh, it really doesn't take that much more fuel to get to Juna as it does to take get to things to the MUN. That's how I test my Juna SSTOs, really. I generally, if my SSTOs can get to the MUN, there go the <laughs> side boosters, by the way. Uh, if an SSTO can fly to the MUN, it can generally do Juna. Not always. For example, if it has very, very stumpy wings, it would struggle quite a lot to fly it might have trouble sort of lifting off from Juno's surface as well but just as a general rule of thumb if you have an SSTO that can land on the Mun it can almost certainly uh, at least get to Juno and it should be it should be able to do Juno is what I'm trying to say here so here we are uh, approaching our apoapsis here to do our uh, orbital insertion burn not a big burn because I took quite a sort of shallow ascent so it wasn't too steep so we ended up having not that much and we didn't really, really need to spend that much energy in order to get our speed up to orbital velocity and then we can start planning out our MUN encounter and as I'm sure any of you that have played the game which I imagine most of you have played the game at some point it's not there's not a lot to it in terms of getting a MUN encounter it's just creating a maneuver node and then just dragging it around until you can get it to hit the MUN. So I guess I don't really talk about that too much. And then just a fairly standard uh, MUN burn of about just under a thousand meters per second is generally what they cost. And I guess I could talk about the actual MUN machine itself now. So now you can see it. We can't see it now. I, I love how I choose to start talking about the payload right as the, one of the first times in the video you can't even see it. But yeah, we've just expended the mammoth stage. Now we have our rhino stage just to complete our transition to the MUN. 
and to uh, circularize the body. So you can see I detached the mammoth engine whilst we're on a collision course with the Mun. This is a similar maneuver that the Apollo rockets did in you know real life, in that they would attach the stage and put it on a collision course with the Moon so that it would be destroyed and not leave any debris in orbit. I know I'm usually not the the tidiest of people when it comes to not leaving debris in orbit, but when I want to, I, I think, like to think I can be fairly, <laughs> fairly uh, uh, what's the word, conservative. E e Eco-conscious, maybe? I don't know. So there below, as you can see, uh, I think that's probably my moon base. I'm looking at the the uh, the graphics on them. Yeah, that's my moon base down there. I could have taken this to the moon base, but I thought, you know, I want this to be its own base uh, on a different biome. And I guess being a mobile base, that's not a problem because it can just drive there. But, uh, but whatever. So you can see this thing uses the... Um, it doesn't use the biggest wheels in the game. I've yet to come up with a rover design using the giant wheels in the game that isn't horrendously ugly. I just think those wheels are so difficult to build into any kind of design. I, I, I really don't like them. I, I am still work. I would like to eventually come up with a rover design that looks, you know, somewhat aesthetically pleasing. But for now, I, I, I prefer doing it this way, where I use lots and lots of the smaller wheels. Um, unlike the uh, other two, I think I've only done two rover missions. Well, there was the Expedition Eve rover, but that was kind of attached to the base. The two sort of standalone rover missions I've done was one to the Mun, and obviously that was in Expedition Eve episode five, and obviously the mobile Juno base. And both of those had boosters that kind of uh, strapped along the sides of the rover, and it would land the rover sort of horizontally, so it would touch down on its wheels. This one is a lot bigger, and in order to, for it to fit inside a sort of fairing that wasn't completely oversized I went with this solution where we're going to land it vertically and then when it's sort of about to hit the ground we'll just kill the engine and just allow it to sort of spin around using SAS and land on its wheels so it will be hitting the ground quite hard it will be quite a lot of force for those wheels to absorb but we do have a lot of wheels so we should be okay and we do have an engineer uh, among our crew members so even if the wheels were destroyed which luckily in this case they weren't even if the engine uh, the wheels are destroyed the engineer can just go on an EVA and repair them so yeah I'm kind of just very sort of slowly and steadily trying to get ourselves onto the slowest possible speed without destroying ourselves and the engine I'm using there is another vector again just because they have uh, enormous gimbal so yeah horrible landing really they have an enormous gimbal range just because this payload obviously requires quite a bit of finesse and you know accuracy in order to touch it down. Neither of those things, neither of those words I would use to describe the touchdown we just did, but whatever. Just made it a lot easier to use the vector, especially given that this is kind of an oversized payload and it's not really the the center of mass isn't very central, so it's good to use a vector for this sort of thing. But there we go. There's the Mun machine all touched down, the wheels and things survived. For transparency's sake, uh, no cheats are being used, like um, no crash damage or anything that wasn't turned on. And you can see we've got the uh, EVA cabin there. Uh, that was a similar thing with the ladder coming down from there. Um, we've got our science pods as well and some ladders just to access the mystery goo units and other science equipment. So like the uh, roving Duna base, I have that separate uh, command pod on the side, which is used as kind of an EVA access point with a ladder. I kind of went the extra mile though and kind of added those um, hatches as well. So when it's not in use, we can retract the ladder and close the payload bay again just to add a bit of shielding, I don't know, from dust storms on the Mun, which probably wouldn't happen that often given that there's no atmosphere on the Mun. It probably would have been a more suitable feature for my Juna rowing base, but, you know, you live and learn. Maybe I'll have to do a, a sequel where I build another Juna machine. But I don't really know where to go from here. I feel like this is kind of at the upper limit of large rovers, uh, especially with those kind of wheels. I'd probably have to go with the larger wheels. Uh, or create some sort of maybe like a train so it's got like an articulated lorry load or articulated trailer I should say who knows we'll have to I'll have to give it some thought and then on the other side with the other cargo bay we have a mining drill just to get us some ore from the surface there's not really a lot of use for it because this thing doesn't have engines or you know doesn't really have any use for it but whatever just for I guess just for the sake of it I have it there and if we wanted to dock this thing onto a ship or we could drive it to my Mun base and dock it there you can see deploy the radiators there we could dock it to the Mun base and then feed the fuel tanks there so even though it has nothing to refuel itself we can always harvest ore and just pretend like we're doing science uh, but it, like I say we could dock it to something or something could dock to it and it could then refuel it so the possibilities are endless I really just kind of to added it just for the sake of adding it so we can see we have quite a high crew capacity with all those cabins i've also got that observatory a cupola module at the front uh just because it's quite a nice uh, pod to have on rovers because you have such a uh, such a good viewing angle. like you have a really you get, it provides a very nice viewing angle um is that but that's pretty much it to be honest i feel like 
I don't need to describe what exactly this thing looks like and everything because you can see it. So I suppose I can just let this part of the footage do the talking. You can see me sort of really, really putting it through its paces here, testing out its straight line speed. It can easily climb up hills, uh, especially with the foot all the way down. And uh, as you can see, the wheels absorb all the impacts quite nicely. Although we're getting a little bit of airtime here and there, and it's not causing any explosions or anything. So overall, I'm pretty happy with this design. And I guess with that, we can pop up these videos on the screen. Top left is uh, just the most recent upload of my channel, whatever that might be. Uh, top right is the roving Duna base. And bottom right was chosen by YouTube's algorithm just for you. So other than that, Twitter, Patreon, Discord, all in the description. And have a good day.